world used to be a bigger place. The world's still the same. It's just less in it. If there is one movie we all get to have that we can enjoy without question, one movie we can thoroughly love despite all logical reasons as to why we shouldn't, for me that movie would be Pirates of the Caribbean at World's End. See, even though I acknowledge that this film isn't a masterclass in plot like Dead Man's Chest, or in general not nearly as strong as Dead Man's Chest, I just don't care. Oh, some of the character intros are a bit too long or even self-indulgent, I don't care. Oh, there are a couple too many subplots going on at once, don't care. Oh, they dig a bit too deep into the lore to the point of it all becoming overly convoluted, nope. Overall, whatever totally reasonable criticism against this movie you throw at me, the only outcome there's ever gonna be is that uh, we're gonna have a problem, mate. But if you, on the other hand, come to me for smaller personal reasons to why this movie is freaking fantastic, I can keep going and going and going until we get to the point where I'm pulling them out of my private parts. The set design and production value as a whole is second to none. The CGI still shines today. The music is legendary. All the characters have their own active goals and motivations that exist in direct conflict with one another. We even get a great friendly rivalry between Jack and Barbosa, which is the one thing we didn't get in the last entry. Just in general, I'd say at world's end is smarter and funnier and more enjoyable than most smart, funny, enjoyable movies out there. There's not been a gathering like this in our lifetime. And I owe them all money. <laughs> that said, since subjective views on movies don't really carry any value, for today we're gonna try to push aside my smaller personal views and instead focus on the one bigger aspect of At World's End that truly does function incredibly well objectively speaking. That being the 20 minute action set piece sequence at the very end, where the Black Pearl finally goes one on one against the Flying Dutchman in the storm of all storms. Because even if you dislike this movie for the most reasonable reasons, this ending finale battle is is still regardless a perfect example of a masterfully constructed action sequence that everyone can enjoy, which it pulls off by succeeding at the four cornerstones of action that all action sequences should aspire to succeed at. Memorability, audience investment, power and impact, as well as emotion. And so, in order to see what I'm talking about here, as well as for a brief moment return to a better place in time where Jack Sparrow was still alive and well, let's sail right into this epic masterful maelstrom battle and find out what exactly it is that makes it so masterful. Here's how to create the ultimate action set piece. The very first thing you need to do when building an action set piece is to make sure it doesn't end up becoming the bland, mundane kind that the audience can just shrug off and forget about right after it's over, because forgettable is the last thing you want your movie to be remembered for. And the way to accomplish this is by placing the sequence in the right setting. Like I already mentioned, the crux of this finale battle is that we have the Black Pearl finally facing off against the Flying Dutchman one on one. But since we've already had a bunch of different ship battles, in this franchise alone before, that's not really a distinguishable or special enough of a sequence in of itself for anyone to remember. And so, what did the filmmakers here add to it to combat this issue? Oh yeah. Just by its very nature, I'd say this Maelstrom setting is freaking awesome tacularly effective, because not only does it automatically raise the inherent feeling of the sequence to the highest, most epic of levels, it also allows for some really cool visual aesthetics. But the most important aspect about setting this battle in the middle of a maelstrom is the fact that the maelstrom setting is the thing that makes the audience remember the battle. Because there is nothing like it that exists in any other movie in existence. Because in essence, this maelstrom setting is like a snapshot thumbnail that plants itself in the audience's head in a way that makes the audience remember it. You remember the revolving hallway in Inception, you remember the downtown shootout in Heat, the train brawl in Spider-Man 2, the heroes versus heroes 
Heroes airport battle in Civil War. As in, you remember back to these sequences through the setting, be that the environment or situation or mood or whatever. And no matter what kind of action sequence you're building, you always need to look for that right special distinguishable signatory snapshot setting to place it in. This might sound pretty obvious, but you'd be surprised how easy it is for writers to just come up with the crux of the action and then leave it at that. And unless you want your sequence to have the same fate as that one other movie action sequence I can't use as an example here because I don't remember it, you need to put in that extra effort. A ship versus ship battle could exist in any pirate's movie, but a ship versus ship battle taking place in the dead epicenter of a maelstrom can exist only in At World's End. And that's the way your brain stores it up. The second thing your action needs to do is always keep the audience invested enough in a way that they actually care about what's happening, which At World's End accomplishes by the use of character moments. See, in this epic maelstrom set piece just like in most others, there's quite a few shots of more generic action where a bunch of characters just fight and swing swords at each other. And as cool and exciting as that can be, alone it very easily still quickly grows tiring and makes the action seem like meaningless noise in a way that distances the audience from it. Because in essence, it's just a bunch of people pointlessly whacking at each other with swords and we don't care. And in order to keep us caring and feeling invested, the movie trickles a big bunch of moments throughout this entire sequence where characters have to make choices and actions to develop or reaffirm their own personality and relationships or to push the plot forward. For example, instead of having Jack just aimlessly run around waving his sword for 20 minutes, the movie constantly places him at roadblocks which he has to maneuver through by showing us who he is. He has escapes the brick like the master escapist he is. He goes to get Davy Jones's chest in his signatory witty scoundrel manner, and when he gets ambushed by Jones and his crew at a roadblock that he can't seem to possibly overcome, what does he do? He overcomes it. Never too late to learn, mate. Not only is this flying bird moment really freaking awesome, it also builds character and the plot. It once again highlights Jack's daring ability to escape any situation, as well as his ingenious foolishness when we realize that by doing this he was able to lure Jones out to him alone, which is just what he needed. And at the same time, it also gets him one step closer to the ultimate finish line of getting the heart when he uses this opportunity to steal the key away from Jones. You can do nothing without a key! I already have the key. No, you don't. Ha <laughs> ha. Gotcha, bitch. In other words, these action events aren't just meaningless pointless noise, but instead there's an actual meaningful point to all of it. What we're seeing serves a purpose, what we're seeing carries weight, which is why we feel invested. When Davy Jones kills Mercer, it's a moment of him finally unchaining himself from the leash of the East India Trading Company. When Liz and Will battle on the deck, it's a moment of them resolving their tense rocky relationship in form of marriage. When Bootstrap Bill attacks Jones, it's a moment of him choosing his son over his duty to the Dutchman. When Tom Hanks stumbles down to all fours on Omaha Beach, it establishes the truly horrible nature of war. When Davy Jones dives after the chest, it establishes that his bond to his heart is even stronger than his hatred of Jack. As in, when these moments unfold, they always ground and humanize the action through the characters, and this way gives us a reason to care and keep caring. At this point we should have at least a pretty okay fully functional action sequence, and the next step is to take what we have and boost it to whole new levels of impact and power in form of payoffs. In essence, payoffs can be viewed as taking puzzle pieces of the story that have been set up before and placing them in their final ultimate slots in the big picture. And as this movie shows, they basically divide into two different categories. Firstly, payoff moments that are set up within the sequence itself. <laughs> You. 
when Davy Jones breaks Jack's sword to end their fight, the movie doesn't just toss the broken sword away, but instead has Jack use it as a knife later on to stab Jones's heart. When Jack breaks the sail to flee from Jones's crew, it also sets up his ultimate escape with the sail when the ship sinks. When Jack steals a pistol from a grunt to shoot the chest away from Jones, he doesn't steal just some random pistol, but instead... Boy, not a pistol. And the reason why utilizing this setup payoff mentality is so crucial is because even though these moments already do have a big meaningful purpose in the sequence in of themselves, building them on top of earlier moments leading up to them is what makes them feel that much more big and powerful. It's what gives them that extra punch. And especially when your action sequence serves as the ultimate finale culmination to your entire movie, that's a feeling you want. But if you're looking to really supercharge your sequence, then you want to also utilize the second category of payoff moments, the kind that have been set up before the sequence. These are half pin barrel hinges. With the right leverage, the door will lift free. Half barrel hinges. Leverage. Jack escaping the brig is a cool character beat, but the thing that makes it more than just that is when you remember that the way he escapes is what he learned from Will all the way back in the first movie. The wedding beat is really nice, but the real impact of it comes from the fact that it finally resolves the tense rocky relationship Liz and Will have had throughout this entire film. Bootstrap Bill choosing his son over his binds to the ship is very impactful, but even more so because his binds to the ship have been established to have grown to the point of becoming seemingly unbreakable. Captain America lifting Thor's hammer is an incredibly powerful hero moment, but what really gives it the punch that it has is the fact that for years we've been setting up that nobody but Thor can lift the hammer, until at this moment we realize that what we've actually been setting up is that Cap can lift it. As a whole, this entire Maelstrom sequence is like a culmination payoff reward for the Calypso subplot, which has been built up for two movies worth. With every click of a payoff puzzle piece falling in place, there's a stream of dopamine released to the audience's brain. The more payoff moments you have, the more dopamine to the brain you have. The bigger you build the set piece sequence moments up to be, the bigger the sequence will feel. And the bigger the sequence feels, the more impact and power it packs. As great as our sequence so far can be, the only way it'll ever become anything more than that is by basing its resolution exclusively in emotion, which is done by making the resolution intimate and personal. With this movie, for example, you'll notice that once we get to the ending stretch of the Maelstrom set piece, all the big loud action spectacle stuff completely zones out, and the whole thing becomes about something much, much smaller. Our main heroes and villain, and their connection to the heart of Davy Jones. This is when we have Jack and Will and Liz give every inch of their strength to try and stop Jones from getting his heart. This is when we have Will attack Jones to save Elizabeth, only to be lethally stabbed as a result. This is when we have Bootstrap Bill break his shackles to the ship to help his son. Overall, this is the part in the sequence where you force your characters to make the most deeply personal final choices and sacrifices that show who they truly are. The place where Tony gives his own life to save his friends. The place where James Coughlin shows he'd rather die with his head up than live with his head down, or in the case of At World's End, where Captain Jack Sparrow reveals the true Captain Jack Sparrow. See, before watching this film again for this video, for some reason I always thought that the reason Jack doesn't just simply stab the heart when he has the chance is because he's selfish, because he's hesitant to commit to the Dutchman. But now, strangely enough, I finally realize that's not actually why Jack doesn't stab the heart. Because by this point, even though there has been some inner conflict throughout the way, the movie has made it very clear that stabbing the heart and becoming an immortal captain is the thing that Jack wants most. But eternity is longer still. The immortal Captain Sparrow. Ooh, I like that. Let someone else dispatch Jones. But immortal has to count for something, eh? If you're in the brig, who's to stab the heart? It does seem to put immortality a bit out of reach. And once we get to the point where Jack is ready to stab the heart and achieve his ultimate personal goal, David Jones responds by doing this. Ah. Ah. 
When Jones lethally stabs Will, he does it specifically in an effort to save his own life. Because it essentially places Jack in this impossible dilemma where if he does stab the heart and take what he wants, it means Will will die as a result. And so the real reason he's hesitant to do it is because despite the cold selfish way he has presented himself to others all this time, he actually does care about Will as well as Will's relationship with Liz. Which ultimately leads to him making one final choice that shows who he truly is. By making Will stab the heart in place of himself, Jack essentially lets go of the thing he wants most. Just to save the life of this one guy he has always acted like he doesn't care one bit about. In other words, we have a selfish narcissist making an ultimate unselfish sacrifice for someone else. And if that doesn't make this resolution and this whole sequence emotional, I don't know what will. If you do all these things we talked about at World's End doing and it still for some reason doesn't produce a fantastic, massively crafted finale action set piece sequence, there is nothing that will.